Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Plant Nutrition Project's Town Hall on herbs, spices, plant powders, and really, I, it, when I started this concept, I was uh, thinking about ways to 10x a diet. So I just, I want to welcome you this evening to uh, our webinar. For those of you that are not familiar with the Plant Nutrition Project, the Plant Nutrition Project is a not-for-profit 501c3 that we started uh, just 10 years ago with the goal and the mission of educating, equipping, empowering, and inspiring healthcare pro providers around the world to utilize whole food plant-based nutrition as the foundation of their practice to prevent, suspend, and reverse disease. It's incredibly important, it's incredibly powerful, and in the last 10 years, we have seen the revolution of lifestyle medicine and plant-based nutrition come to the forefront in ways that um, we did not expect. And, for those of us that have been doing this a long time, Michael Greger, myself, uh, we are excited about what we're seeing because we are seeing the first stages of infiltration into healthcare. Um, what I will, I, what I believe, will be a revolution in healthcare in the next 20 years, where every single patient will have the opportunity to hear about plant-based nutrition and lifestyle medicine as the first intervention for their diseases and the primary prevention for non-communicable and lifestyle diseases. So. I want to welcome you to our webinar this evening. We have a distinguished panel that I will introduce in just a moment. Um, and I just want to give <clears throat> a few uh, minutes of introduction to our topic this evening because it's really an important topic. Uh, we try to do these town halls about four times per year, selecting kind of interesting topics to do a deep dive with really the goal of tackling the evidence to find out what the science says now, what we know, what we don't know, and maybe what we need to know, and hopefully there's inspiration maybe in our conversation tonight for some new studies to dig a little deeper into this topic. When I first had the concept for this, um, this topic, I was thinking, can I actually improve my diet? Uh, I've walked this journey for now 20 years, and uh, earlier this year I asked myself the question, can I 10x my diet and lifestyle, um, along with other parts of my life? And these questions led me to other curious questions about really the, the scientific literature and the evidence around adding fresh herbs, spices, concentrated plants or plant powders, special teas, green tea, matcha tea, to my diet that would actually enhance my exposure or total antioxidant capacity of my diet and really improve my health, optimize my biochemistry. And so that is kind of the essence or the genesis for our evening. You know, more than 2,500 years ago, Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And that was kind of the origin. In, in fact, Hippocrates used to ask his patients about the quality of the soil that their food was grown in. However, the food is medicine philosophy was really de detoured in the 19th century by the Industrial Revolution. And again, in the 20th century, when the saying better living through chemistry really evolved and took us down the road of reductionism and compartmentalization. And we lost our way. In 1912, as we dug deeper into food, Casimir Funk coined the term vitamins and medicine race to find solutions to important conditions like pellagra, scurvy, and beriberi. And it was about this time that we saw the history of vitamin supplements, uh, 1916 with Mastin's yeast vitamin tablets. In 1922, the American Family Physician Journal published a glowing rev a review of Parks Davis supplement called Metagen which really was the first supplement and led to a revolution. Ironically, today, there are 85,000 unique supplements for sale on the market, and that sector is expected to grow to $505 billion by 2028. There may be a few good ones in there, but we don't need 85,000 supplements. <clears throat> you know, further as we evolved, um, <clears throat> as men were coming back from World War II, a third of them were found to suffer from disabilities known to stem from poor nutrition. In response, Franklin Delano Roosevelt convened the National Nutrition Conference for Defense in 1941. And the result was the first government-sponsored RDAs, six vitamins, two minerals. And again, the solution was not food, but a supplement. And this was the uh, advent of the one-a-day vitamin starting in 1943. And even more relevant, this evening, in the 1980s, the Japanese government was the first to create a new class of functional foods that outlined the additional benefits beyond the basic recommended dietary allowances. 
These foods, which are eligible to bear a special seal, are recognized now as the foods for specified health use. <clears throat> now, as, tw as of 2020 in Japan, there are nearly 1,071 food products that have gained this status in Japan. The National Academy of Sciences Food and Nutrition Board defined functional foods as any modified food or food ingredient that may provide a health benefit beyond the traditional nutrients it contains. Now today, this is everything from kelp burgers to adapt adaptogenic drinks and uh, bean pastas and also includes pure plant powders. The Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics uh, had a position statement on functional foods and um, they said that functional foods cover a variety of foods, minimally processed whole foods, along with fortified, enriched, or enhanced foods can all be functional foods, including pastas, nut milks, and many others today. Generally, these foods have potentially beneficial effects on health when consumed on a regular basis and at certain levels. Any health benefits attributed to functional foods should be based on sound, accurate scientific criteria, including rigorous studies of safety and efficacy and interactions with other dietary components need to be assessed. And so, um, we thought it was important tonight to, you know, have a conversation around the benefits and the science of utilizing herbs and spices in your diet, uh, looking at things like different types of teas and evaluating this, this sector of uh, functional foods. <clears throat> I just want to recognize this evening before we get started, the history uh, of plant-based nutrition and food as medicine and recognize champions and pioneers from every generation that have pointed back to the ground, food, and our roots as a clarion call to retur return to whole plant foods first um, as the vision for healthcare. And I wanna honor their bold and courageous stances they've gone before us. And really we're standing on a platform that they've helped to build uh, through their blood, sweat, and tears. Our Plantrition Project and our panelists tonight really all believe in a, a whole plant food first fix as a foundation for the prevention, suspension, and reversal of disease. And so with that, I wanna recognize and welcome each of our panelists tonight. Dr. Michael Greger, as you all know, is uh, the founder of nutritionfacts.org, New York Times best-selling author, incredible uh, champion of plant-based nutrition around the world, and someone who has changed my life and many other lives. So welcome, Michael, it's an honor to have you here tonight. Our second panelist, Dr. Bharat Agarwal, is uh, currently the founding director of Inflammation Research Center in San Diego, California. He was a Ransom Horn Distinguished Professor of Exper Experimental Therapeutics, Cancer Research, Cancer Medicine, Biochemistry, and Immunology, and Chief of Cytokine Research Section in the Department of Experimental Therapeutics at the University of Texas MD Anderson in Texas. Uh, Dr. Agarwal discovered TNF-alpha and has walked through the uh, the entire history of cytokines, inflammation, uh, disease, and healing, and has a, a tremendous historical perspective. Dr. Agarwal is currently a member of the editorial boards of 24 international journals and served as a reviewer for more than 160 journals, grant pro proposals, and PhD thesis, uh, theses. Dr. Agarwal has edited 15 books and co-authored his best-selling book, which I have on my shelf, Healing Spices. And finally, we're honored to have John Blair. Uh, John was on the Board of Directors of uh, Council for Responsible Nutrition in Washington, D.C. for more than a decade and served as chair for 2013 and 14. He uh, is the vice president, retired vice president of Juice Plus, and initiated and managed an extensive body of peer-reviewed clinical trials and research on functional foods, plant powders like Juice Plus as a functional food. Um, John is a frequent speaker on health and fitness and whole food-based nutrition to audiences around the world. Uh, he lives a very active life and healthy lifestyles, an avid golfer, cyclist, skier, formerly ranked a uh, World Masters handball player, earning 15 U.S. National Handball Championships. Um, and I invited John because he really, again, has a, a great historical perspective of the literature going all the way back into the early days of research on functional foods and uh, that historical perspective is important. So gentlemen, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, it's an honor to have all of you and welcome. Thank you. Pleasure thank you. to be here. So I thought I would start with a few questions and uh, you know, we'll go to our audience, which I see is growing over 400 right now. 
Uh, in about uh, 30, 40 minutes, we'll start taking some audience questions. But um, I thought it would be a great place to start uh, with the uh, herbs and spices. You know, they have been used throughout history to flavor food. They've been embraced for their therapeutic benefits. They're an integral part of every culture's food system and healthcare system historically. So uh, Bharat, I think I would like to just ask you first, um, you know, just from a historical standpoint, why are herbs and spices fundamental to every culture's food and health? What is it that they have known historically and um, where should we start, you know, this conversation? I think it is a very good question. And uh, I have my perspectives on it. And I think, uh, as we all know, it is our mother who brings us in this world. And if it was not for the mother, we will not be here. And it is a mother nature is there to take care of us. And when we talk about mother nature, is we are talking about all the herbs and spices and everything provided from the earth. And there are a whole bunch of them. I don't have to tell you, you already know very well. So these are all the different plants. So we are humans, we are born and, uh, and their plants are there to take care of us. Question is which plant and how does, what does it do? How does it do? And as you know very well know that I come originally from India. The word Bharat means India. And the word itself comes from a Sanskrit language, which means the one who revels in knowledge is Bharat. Okay, just for your information. <laughs> so Bharat is the land of all the spices. And, uh, you know, whether be that British or uh, whosoever, you know, they were all looking for spices. And as you know, Vasco de Gama and Christopher Columbus. And uh, here I live in San Diego and there is a guy, Jose Cabarillo. And all these three guys were looking for spices. And the only guy who, and they knew spices are very synonymous with India which means they were looking for India. And, uh, and out of all these three guys that I mentioned, Vasco de Gama was the only one who actually found the spices and he's the one who landed up in India. And, we, and there is a place called Goa and we organize a conference on uh, nutraceuticals and that is our first international conference on nutraceuticals, and that happened to be in Goa. And I visited the house of Vasco de Gama over there, which is there even as of today. So anyway, so just to provide you the historical perspectives, Ayurveda is another one, spices is one. Ayurveda is a science that has been around for thousands of years. And the word Ayurveda in itself means the science of long life. And there are zillions of compounds from Ayurveda, and we have worked uh, quite extensively on them as well. And, uh, and uh, Google in particular, you know, Googling the Google. And this Google came along just yesterday, but there is another Google that is uh, an herb that has been around for thousands of years. And so anyway, so we have uh, worked on uh, all of that and I can go on and on, but I stop right there before uh, I say something more. So let's just talk briefly about why herbs and spices are so effective uh, at reducing inflammation and improving the quality of, um, of someone's diet, you know, based, we know about auric value, but what's really going on biochemically? I'll kind of toss this both to you and Michael. So you want uh, Michael to say something or you want well, I'll to start with to say you, something? Bharat. We'll start with okay. you and uh, then we'll go to Michael. Okay. So that's another very good question. So it just so happened that year was 1980. And I ran into two guys who were graduate from Harvard 
and they both moved to the bay area and one guy you may know very well and and the guy who started apple and that is steve job okay and that was year 1980 and it is steve job who had a friend called bob swanson and he started the first biotechnology company in the world called genentech so so they both moved to the bay area in 1980 from harvard and they both started a company one guy started genentech other guy started apple and the first apple by the way that he made that he brought it to us and i have been apple ever since and uh, so within a week after i joined i happened to be at ucsf and uh, i moved to this company genentech and within a week after i joined bob swanson walks in my office and bart he said i'm sorry i could not say your name bharat can i call you bart and bart in san francisco is called barrier rapid transit so he was the one to give me the name bart okay so bart i want you to find a cure to cancer i said wait a minute i don't even know how to spell cancer i've been working at ucsf and i've been working on this hormones and uh, but i don't know anything about cancer he said that's why we hired you so anyway so that is my introduction to cancer and i ended up grinding up the immune system and immune system plays a very important role in uh, in cancer it was known even way back then so there was nothing known from the immune system how it does what it does but it has a role in cancer so i was the first one to identify a molecule from the immune system that i named tumor necrosis factor tnf and that is based upon cells in culture and based upon animal studies that we did that tnf will kill the tumor and not the normal guy oh that's fantastic and uh, so then we asked the question which part of this uh, immune system it is coming from and we found that was coming from macrophages and as you know immune, this uh, immune system you have macrophages and you have a lymphocyte now you have nk and all that so so we asked okay so this is coming from macrophages how about lymphocytes and we found that also kill the cancer guy and so we ended up identifying another factor that was originally called lymphotoxin and we were the first one to isolate and sequence it and named it tnf beta so we had a tnf alpha that was coming from monocytes and then tnf beta that was coming from uh, lymphocytes okay so that's fine everything is based upon uh, either cell culture or animals but humans are neither cell culture not animals unless we test in humans we will not know what it does if anything it does anything so that is the time there is a cancer center called md anderson cancer center now everybody knows in those days hardly anybody knew md anderson cancer center so they approached me that we would like to recruit you in md anderson cancer center and we want you to try your tnf in our cancer patients so apparently i said look for me to be recruited i need a position they said no problem we will recruit you as a full professor and then i need a money said so no problem we have a mr clayton i don't know most of you may have heard of howard hugh and howard hugh had a friend called bill clayton so apparently howard hugh moved to from uh, you know here in california to las vegas and bill clayton was another one so they both set up the foundation howard hugh foundation foundation and clayton foundation and uh, and i became a clayton fellow so clayton was the one fund you know funded all my research so they put our tnf in our cancer patients all the patients responded but they got more sick than ever before so it is that time i begin to ask myself a question hey wait a minute should it be called tumor necrosis factor or tumor promoting factor because everything we did in the animals it was killing the cancer guy and when we put it in humans it was promoting tumors so so that is the time we begin to look at tnf blockers 
And so it is at that time I remembered that, uh, by the way, Tiana Blocker happened to approve by the FDA today uh, with a market over $50 billion a year and no drug known to man as a bigger market. And so they are all primarily antibodies. And that is the time I begin to look at some small molecules that can block TNF. And just so happened, <coughs> my family you know, was very, very poor when I was growing up. And anytime we get hurt or anything, you know, happens, we never had enough money to go to a doctor, but we were always alternate therapies, therapies, you know, homemade therapies, you know, trying it out. And one of the therapies that was always tried was turmeric. Okay. So, I mean, no matter what happens, you know, they will try turmeric and turmeric did wonders. So I said, look, wait a minute, let me try this turmeric that if that blocks TNF and long behold, and that was going back early eighties, long behold, yes, there was, you know, it completely shut down TNF, you know, it blocked both the production and the action of TNF. And, t and turmeric, as you know, is just one of the spice. So I began to ask other spices. So I went spice by spice by spice and they all blocked TNF. And then I begin to ask, how about Ayurveda? Again, one after the other. So anyway, to make long story short, that's how we got into natural products. And uh, we published a lot of paper, a lot of books that you already mentioned. I don't want to say anything, but that's how we got into mother nature, that how these things do, what they do, and what is at the molecular level they are doing it. At that time, there were less than 50 papers on turmeric, curcumin the yellow color in turmeric. And mind you, turmeric has a, over a, you know, 100 different compounds. And curcumin is just one of them and that gives a yellow color. And so we begin to ask even other compounds and so forth. And apparently it's all block uh, uh, TNF and all block inflammation. And inflammation became, as you know, there is a whole issue of science of 2022 devoted to inflammation. And the whole issue of uh, 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 science 2013, devoted to inflammation. So it is becoming a very, inflammation is becoming the key to most chronic disease, even coronavirus. Everything coronavirus does is through inflammation. Again, we wrote a whole paper on spices, inflammation, and coronavirus. And so point of the matter is inflammation, inflammation, inflammation. And that's why we set up the Inflammation Research Center. So I think that most of the natural products that are, I know of, that they work through blocking inflammation. So I stopped right there. Yeah, thank you, Parath. That was very interesting history. <clears throat> I really enjoyed that very much. Uh, for those of you guys see some questions popping up in the Q&A, if you have questions, there's a Q&A bubble at the bottom of your Zoom panel, and uh, you can begin typing your questions in there. And in about 20 minutes or so, we'll start taking some questions from you all. Uh, Michael, I want to segue <clears throat> first with a, a, a simple uh, question, and then we'll talk a little bit more in detail about herbs, spices, and auric values. But the idea of curcumin <clears throat> versus whole turmeric, you know, Bharat was saying there's over a hundred different molecules, you know, curcumin, just one of them in, um, in turmeric. And I know that you've done, looked at the research on turmeric versus curcumin and the whole food versus just the, the isolated curcumin. Do you want to expound a little bit on that and talk about the, the benefits of maybe whole turmeric versus curcumin and how that might impact the, uh, the systemic inflammation? Yeah, there's a number of ways you can do those studies. You can compare turmeric with curcumin uh, isolated, or you can uh, you can extract curcumin from turmeric and give curcumin-free turmeric to see what the other uh, curcuminoids do, uh, the other compounds. Um, and uh, and in general, when you do that, whether you do that with uh, you know, anthocyanins and berries or, or various phytonutrients, you typically find this kind of synergistic reaction. It's not only an additive effect where uh, many of the different components have their small effect and you put it all together and you add it up, um, but a synergistic effect such that the, uh, the sum is greater, the, the, the product is greater than the sum of its parts, 
Um, and so if you have, uh, you know, extract one of blueberries, extract two blueberries, like, for example, the hydrophilic, the, 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 the water soluble versus fat soluble components, um, they each may have a certain effect, but when combined together, have a greater effect than you would get from either alone. And so those kind of data would argue towards a, a whole foods approach um, towards um, towards uh, to, to, uh, towards something like inflammation, right? Um, as uh, Barat said, it's very easy to tell if a food is pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. You feed it to people and you look at systemic inflammatory biomarkers like uh, tumor necrosis factor or C-reactive protein or interleukin-6. And when researchers have done, there's thousands of studies like this, Research came up with uh, something called a dietary inflammatory index, which just compiles those thousands of uh, studies uh, together to see which are the most, so you could rate someone's diet as being uh, pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. And when they did that, the most pro-inflammatory food components uh, in the diet was saturated fat and trans fat. Um, saturated fat, um, as many of you know, top five sources of the United States cheese, desserts um, uh, like cake and ice cream, chicken, pork, and then burgers. Um, thankfully, added trans fats have been removed um, from the food supply, and so we're just left with the small amounts um, eating meat and dairy. In terms of anti-inflammatory components, um, the single most anti-inflammatory food um, ever found was indeed the spiced turmeric, followed by ginger and garlic. So the top three of all the foods that have been looked at, of the thousands of studies, all three are spices, with the most anti-inflammatory beverage being green or black tea. Uh, the two most anti-inflammatory food components are fiber and flavones. The dietary fiber is found in all whole plant foods, but uh, concentrated in whole grains and legumes, beans, split peas, chickpeas, lentils, and flavones are plant compounds uh, found in herbs, vegetables, and fruits, leading sources in the U.S. diet, parsley, um, bell peppers, celery, apples, and oranges. The most flavone-filled beverage is chamomile tea, which is why we think the chamomile tea is so anti-inflammatory. Um, and so um, uh, uh, the wonderful thing about spices is that they're so concentrated that you can actually do randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials by stuffing something like ground ginger or garlic powder into a pill and pitting it against a placebo um, which looks, tastes, um, and, you know, in, in, in every other way, it looks the same. Um, it's such that even the researcher doesn't know until the code is broken at the end. And so you can prove beyond a shadow of doubt cause and effect. So it's not just that garlic eaters have lower rates of cancer or something. You can prove by randomizing people to garlic or no garlic placebo, um, you can actually prove cause and effect, which is harder to do with some of these other foods. That's amazing. So, Top three, turmeric, ginger, garlic. Um, how about herbs? Um, well, in terms of, uh, so uh, flavone containing herbs like uh, parsley, um, but uh, um, uh, uh, but uh, that uh, I'd have to look at the whole list to, to, yeah, to, list to tell you. So, but I think if I remember marjoram, uh, was number one, then oregano, marjoram, they're both in the same family, but in terms of not, that wasn't inflammation, that was in terms of antioxidant content. I think the most antioxidant rich, typical herb on the market is marjoram, put it in your pasta sauce. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And so that total antioxidant capacity is important. Uh, I know there's been a number of studies looking at total antioxidant capacity of a diet and the relative reduction in risk of just about every single disease. And so herbs and spices are an excellent way to uh, add additionally um, expose yourself to those antioxidants. You know, it's in my, in my uh, kind of estimation when I asked myself the question this year, like how can I 10X my diet? Uh, you know, I started looking at TAC values and auric values and you know, the nutrient density of specific foods to try and increase my exposure on a daily basis. Um, so Barat, oh, go ahead, Michael. what do you want to say? I just wanted to, to know that that's on a gram for gram basis. And so, yes, the highest antioxidant content of kind of a typical food you could buy is something like cloves, but how many cloves can you actually eat? Now, they're so powerful that just a little dusting can really boost the antioxidant content of oatmeal or something. 
Uh, but, you know, it's easier to eat a handful of nuts than it is to eat a handful of nutmeg, you know, I mean, so <laughs> you, you realize that on a gram for gram basis, yes, herbs and spices beat out everything else. But in terms of, you know, foods you can actually eat by the serving, um, we're looking at uh, berries as the most antioxidant um, rich food. Right. And so these are just additive into the foods, looking for ways to layer them in. And so, Barad, in your research, uh, what were some of the ways that you recommended uh, for people to add these kind of new spices and herbs into their diet? This is another very, very important point. And, uh, and that is what uh, Michael was alluding to. There is a one thing to know what is good for you. And there is something else. Okay, if it is good for me, what is the best way I can consume? You know, what kind of dishes can I make? Or how can I, you know, eat it and still make it very palatable? And that's another science, and that is called cooking. And just so happened, with me at least anyway, that I came to Berkeley in 1973. Okay. So that is where I was a PhD student. And when I came to Berkeley in 1973, I was looking for some vegetarian diet. And I could not find one. So that is the time I started cooking. So I've been doing cooking for the last 50 years and, you know, and experimenting here and experiment there, you know, and my wife is not here, but she will tell you that uh, I am always either cooking in the, at work or cooking at home. And I love to do that. Okay. And I love to, in fact, it's so much so that MD Anderson has a department of integrated medicine and they wanted me to show the people that how to consume spices. So I was actually giving cooking classes, you know, that what to do, how to do. And so I enjoy doing that. And you heard about turmeric and you heard about curcumin and the curcumin is, we, oh, by the way, we are just putting together you know, as you know, a lot of things, as I mentioned, works in the test tube, they work in animal, but we are human. So we want to see, you know, if it works on humans or not. And apparently we formed a company called Curry Pharmaceutical, and we went to the FDA for approval of turmeric and uh, curcumin, and FDA declined. And why? Because FDA said, hey, wait a minute, people have been eating this for thousands of years. Why do you need my permission? Just go home and eat as much as you want. And that's the end of the story. You know, so they declined. Okay. So, so point of the matter, we asked how many clinical trials have been done. And we are writing this review right now, by the way. And so we found over 500 clinical trials have been done with curcumin. 500. Okay. And another 500 clinical trials that have been done with the turmeric. So we are putting both side by side in one review. Okay that the role of turmeric and curcumin lessons to be learned from clinical trials. And that will tell you that how much you should be consuming and what it is good for. See, and the, you know, the word science came only in year 1500. Until that time, there was no word science. So until that time, what people were doing that they were, uh, you know, uh, people out there, they call rishis, means saints. So these saints were doing, they were doing their own science, you know, in own, their own little villages. And they have put together all kinds of properties of turmeric and curcumin. And I happen to put together that what are the various names of this? You will be amazed. Thousands of years people have known this. And simply we are reviving it in a completely new different language. So we have put together all that masala. Masala means information, you know, and masala is also used as a, as a spice, you know, putting together half a dozen spices and call it a masala. So we have put together all that together and, uh, and just to see the history as such. And so absolutely mind-boggling. It is just a matter of how curious you are. <clears throat> and said so one of the name of turmeric is madhu nashani madhu means sugar nashani means destroy it destroys sugar which means it is anti diabetic 
So if somebody has a problem with diabetes, which is very, very common, and it will completely disappear just by eating turmeric. And again, the question is how much? Another name of turmeric is rubber gavasa. Rubber means fat, gavasa means disappear, means it is anti-obesity. Again, question is how much? So we have a clinical trial. So anyway, so I can go on and on. So point of the matter, these are all the names given to it for thousands of years, thousands. There's a lot of ancient wisdom. Yeah, a lot of ancient wisdom. You're absolutely right. Spices and herbs Nobody and can foods. deny it. There's ancient wisdom. And, and you can do clinical trial health. now based upon all that. And it is all there. Right. And John, I want to pull you into the conversation because uh, you've been a part of uh, a lot of the anti-inflammatory effect of uh, whole plant powders. And so um, maybe you can also just describe some of the early research that you were involved in <laughs> looking at uh, how whole plants capitalized, as maybe Michael had said, uh, affect inflammatory reactions in the body. Sure, thank you, Scott. Uh, I'm enjoying the conversation. Uh, we came at this issue from a different perspective. I originally was looking to buy a juicing company. I was fascinated with juicing. and uh, Unfortunately, the convenience aspect got in the way. The the motivation, of course, was what you described, Scott, as the displacement in the modern diet of the fruit and vegetable food group by packaged, processed food, fast food. And of course, juicing was the attempt to get fruit and vegetables back into the picture. But unfortunately, most people gave up on it after two or three weeks because it was too much work. And also taste was a factor. So people were only juicing the things that uh, they liked the taste of originally. So. Uh, we looked at the possibility of doing the juicing on a large scale and finding a way to dry the juice or the slurry because we took nothing out. We did not take out the fiber, anything, just the water. Uh, we'd go through a process where the particle size is pulverized through a series of shear pumps so that the nutrients that are locked in the fiber are released into the slurry. And then the key is to dry at low temperature. So you do as little damage as possible to the nutrient value of the original produce. And so we did this with a combination of fruits, with a combination of vegetables and a combination of berries and grapes. Uh, and we developed these concentrated plant powders. Well, since taste was an issue, we decided to put it into a capsule. And we initially had very good uh, success in terms of our individual intake, but the question was, can we put enough in there to do people any good? And that was the genesis of our clinical research program because we didn't know the answer. We decided to go into the lab and uh, conduct uh, some cl randomized clinical studies, starting with just bioavailability. To, to see if the nutrients were in fact absorbed. And excitement there led to, uh, I think the two the areas which underpin chronic disease, that's oxidative stress, redox biology and inflammation. And we did a number of studies in, in that area uh, onto the immune system, to DNA, uh, lung health, skin health, heart health, uh, all these areas where uh, basically I liken it to a, a Ferrari. I, I think the human body is an incredible, magnificent machine like a Ferrari. You put garbage in the gas tank of a Ferrari, it's not going to run. So what we're doing is putting concentrated nutrients from a wide variety of fruits and vegetables into the body and the body absorbs and uses these nutrients because I, I think we evolved as a species eating these plants and therefore the body needs these antioxidants polyphenols other chemicals that are in all of these plants uh, to function uh, in a healthy way and the more that we've done i've been associated now with 47 46 or 7 uh, randomized clinical trials that have shown uh, basically that the powders 
are very similar in activity to what someone would get with more of a plant-based diet. And there's a tremendous amount of literature on uh, the positive effects of plant-based diet in uh, terms of immune system DNA. We've, we've even gone into the area of nutrigenomics uh, where we've seen gene expression improvement in uh, uptick of over a thousand positive genes uh, turning off of almost 500 negative genes in only eight weeks on concentrated plant powders. So uh, it really has, and, and now we're even looking at cognitive function and other areas. So uh, it's no surprise, we, the product was in a capsule, but we didn't want people to think we were just a vitamin. So we went down the path of clinical research to show or try to show that one would get the same results uh, from concentrated plant powders that you would get from the plants, eating the plants themselves. And uh, we're big supporters of a plant-based diet. So I'm not here to claim that it's that uh, concentrated plant powders are a substitute for a healthy diet. Uh, certainly something is lost in the process. Things like enzymes are, are very susceptible to any kind of heat at all. Uh, but we've, we've done the, the best that we can in terms of uh, creating these concentrated powders with a minimal amount of heat in the shortest amount of time. Uh, and, and it's been pretty exciting. Great, thank you, John. You know, I, um, I've been a part of some projects where uh, they are dehydrating and, and creating powders from foods to ship to third world countries from, you know, food that would have been thrown in, in the garbage, so food waste, and the plants are uh, dehydrated and then shipped over to third world countries because of still the nutritional content. The, the, some of the value is still there, a lot of the value, and can yeah. serve a really important um, uh, as a really important resource and nutrient base for people uh, that are at risk. Of course, not, not all plant powders are the same. Uh, first, you have to start with the best possible raw material, you know, so the, where the fruits and vegetables are grown, the berries, the grapes, uh, how they're grown, uh, and the, the processing, again, that some sort of juicing or crushing mechanism before the dehydration to release the nutrients, low temperature drying, but any kind of plant powders are, are valuable. Uh, and uh, you're just, one would just be looking for the best they could possibly find. But I think you can extrapolate what we've done and the research we've done uh, to some extent to almost all kinds of plant powder. Great, thank you, John. Uh, Michael, I have a question for you. Um, there are uh, a number of like green grass powders that are out there. Uh, you know, obviously different exposures through grass powders than you might get through strawberries or blackberries. Is there any research on the grass powders and how they may or may not impact the health of the gut and someone's um, inflammatory levels or health? Kale is cheaper. <laughs> uh, I mean, the only role I see for uh, plant powders is for the research. Right. I mean, so, you know, a Harvard Nurses Health Study found that women, for example, who ate blueberries seem to have, you know, a delayed cognitive aging. That's fantastic. But maybe it's because berry eaters are, you know, higher socioeconomic class, they have better health insurance or something. The only way to prove it is to put it to the test. You can do that in rats. Um, but uh, unless you're concerned about the cognition of your pet rat, there's not a lot of relevance um, for your family. And so that's but you can't just, well, why don't you give people blueberries? Well, the problem is, is there's an expectation effect. People have heard that blueberries are good for your brain. So then when you test them, they might do better than if you, than, than if you hadn't, if, than if you were in the control group and didn't get blueberries, right? The way we get around these kind of expectation effects in drug trials is we have the placebo control. The only way we can do, one of the few ways we can do that in food is by powder. We powder the blueberries, and thanks to the wonders of food technology, you can actually make 
a, a, a purple maltodextrin blueberry flavored powder that literally people can't tell the difference. I mean, they, same taste, same texture, looks the same. You give people those pouches and even the researcher doesn't know who actually got the real blueberries and who got the fake blueberries. And then you can actually see, and when you do that, you can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt, no one knows who got the real blueberries that within literally hours you get improvement um, in, uh, in, in uh, cognition on various tests with, um, with these now with, uh, you know, giving somebody, uh, you know, wild blueberry powder. So should you go out and eat wild blueberry powder? No, the only reason they powdered it is so they could do this double blinded control. What that proves is that blueberries are good for you because all they took out was the water. And so what that study should tell you is go out and eat blueberries, put blue, you know, get some frozen wild blueberries and put them on your oatmeal. Um, but that, that, but I, I it, that it's critical for the research step. But I think the lesson we should take for that is eat whole foods. So if you had a greens powder that showed some beneficial effects from the nitrates or whatever, what that should tell us is we should eat greens, uh, not that we should uh, take powders. As far as I'm concerned. Well, Michael, let me say this: uh, we, all of our clinical research is double-blind, placebo-controlled, and does in crossover studies. Uh, and one of the big factors is convenience and taste. Uh, and there is a value to having a baseline every day of, you know, 10 vegetables, eight fruits, 10 uh, berries and grapes, that is a much wider variety, much wider than people can eat every day on their own. And uh, we actually have conducted for 25 years a market research, not a clinical study, with over a million families where uh, if the parents would take the plant powders, we gave it to the children for free and asked the families to give us a survey. And what we found is that within one year, the kids are drinking more water, less soda. They're eating more fruits and vegetables and berries and grapes and less fast food. They're missing fewer days of work and school. And so it actually becomes a catalyst to a healthier lifestyle. 60% in the second year on most of these factors, 70% in the third year. So it is a complement to a healthy diet which actually becomes a catalyst to a healthier lifestyle. And uh, a million families is a lot of data. Uh, and so I would argue with that on that. I think there's a value of entry, which is convenient, consistent, and easy for the families as a place to start to complement the changes they're trying to make. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. And thank you, Michael. Um, we have a bunch of questions that are kind of piling up, uh, almost 60 right now. So we're going to, I want to just transition to some of these questions from our audience. We've had such a great audience participation. Uh, let's see. We have the question um, they're finding uh, some excessive glyphosate and other toxins and spices, herbs. And uh, is that uh, something we should be concerned about? Do we need to purchase organic or conventional herbs and spices okay? Um, maybe Michael, do you want to take that one? I'm surprised I'm surprised they find uh, a glyphosate in, in herbs and spices just because it's not a, I mean, it must right. be some kind of incidental, you know, I mean, they're just, we, we yet to have genetically modified herbs and spices that can resist that herbicide. So there's no reason, I mean, for the, uh, I mean, uh, uh, farmers, farmers would go out of their way not to expose their plants to herbicides that would kill their plant. Right. Um, but uh, there are some concerns about uh, toxic heavy metals. And so, you know, uh, there is tremendous traditional knowledge going back thousands of years, as Dr. Agarwal has said. However, there is also in the Ayurvedic um, tradition, um, you know, adding going out of your way to add toxic heavy metals like mercury to you know, so-called Ayurvedic remedies. Um, and you see that around the world with traditional therapies where um, they're giving, you know, infants lead to help them sleep better and, 
yeah. I mean, so there's a limit to traditional knowledge, and that's why we have science, which is fantastic, but it can certainly be a jumping point um, uh, in terms of inadvertent heavy metal exposure. Um, there's a concern with um, Chinese tea plantations. They got rid of leaded gas a lot later than, than, uh, than we did. But the tea leaf, but the lead in the tea does not leach from the tea leaves into the water um, uh, at such that it's not a problem unless you're actually eating the tea, meaning matcha tea, or you're putting green tea leaves into your smoothie. If you're doing that, then there's a concern, particularly for young children and pregnant women, about getting excess lead exposure. If you're actually eating tea that's sourced from China, if you do eat tea, um, which I encourage people to do, um, like put matcha in a smoothie or something. I love matcha, frozen banana ice cream in a blender, two ingredients, delicious. I would source it from Japan, which doesn't have uh, the same kind of uh, lead in their uh, tea plantations. Great, thank you. Uh, and Bharat, this question's for you. Um, you know, the activation of turmeric and uh, especially curcumin has long been thought, you know, in Ayurveda to be heat, fat, and then, you know, the pepperine and pepper. Uh, is that necessary? Are there new ways to activate that? What's the leading science on activation of some of these um, these uh, compounds in spices like turmeric or others? Yeah. So <laughs> this is another uh, very good question. And, uh, you know, it's uh, interesting you asked. There is a, a place uh, you heard of, Kashmir. There is a place, Jammu Kashmir, and they have an institute of integrated medicine. And it is in that institute that, as far as I know, they found for the first time that black pepper inhibits cytochrome P450 enzyme. So in other words, if turmeric is combined with black pepper, turmeric stays around in the body a lot longer when it is combined with black pepper or for that matter, curcumin. So that is what became a super curcumin. And that is true not only just for curcumin, but also for a lot of other natural products that black pepper inhibits the enzyme that causes the metabolism. And people have been eating for black pepper, you know, thousands of years. So turn out that the mechanism by which black pepper is helping is that the spice stays around in the body a lot longer. Therefore, it can be very synergistic. And we have tested that, other people have tested that. And so I think that is all in your favor. Great, thank you, Bharat. Uh, Michael, uh, turmeric, root, spice, powder, fresh, dried, any difference or benefit in one over the other? And maybe you know, no, you know. Normally, I would say um, preferences for kind of fresh as a default. Um, however, the the um, uh, you know the I was kind of schooled by the research done on uh, ground ginger, dried ginger. Uh, some of the effects of ginger are due to dehydration products, like something called shojo. Um, which uh, which uh, only is not present in fresh ginger, only in dried ginger, um, and is why, for example, ground ginger can cause people to lose body fat, um, but fresh ginger doesn't. Um, so we think that's actually a show gel effect. And so, um, you know, when I read a study on ground ginger um, uh, and say, wow, it has this beneficial effect in this double blind randomized placebo controlled trial, um, my first reaction is, oh, eat ginger. But no, we should actually be, no, eat ground. Look, the study found ground ginger. It doesn't necessarily translate. Um, and so that gave me a little pause that, you know, we shouldn't just automatically assume. And so as far as I'm concerned, if there is a study that shows some remarkable effects of turmeric and they're using, a, and they're using a specific dose and a specific form, then if you're interested in your patients having that effect, I would give that same dose in the same dosing um, at the same schedule, um, because that's what the science has shown us. Um, uh, and so I, 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 you know, I, I, I tend to, 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 to default to as nature intended, food as grown, but it's interesting that there are 
uh, may be exceptions to that rule. Great, thank you. Can I comment something? Please. I, it is interesting, you know, we are talking about ginger and turmeric. And if you look at uh, uh, the turmeric root, it is another ginger. So ginger is white in color, turmeric is yellow in color. Otherwise, they are exactly the same. You can go in your any grocery store and get a, either a yellow ginger or white ginger. So it is available, belong to the same family. They are all part of the root. It is a rhizome. And that is where the turmeric comes from. And that's where the ginger comes from. And ginger oils, which are present in ginger, they are anti-inflammatory. So in the turmeric is a curcumin, which is anti-inflammatory. So they do all the same thing. So just, I want to mention. So here's a question, I think for all three of you, uh, from uh, an athlete <clears throat> um, looking to optimize performance. Uh, is there any research looking at using herbs, spices, plant powders or, or concentrations of plants uh, to improve performance or recovery. Um, Bharat, do you know of any? We'll start with you, then we'll go to John and with Michael. So it depends what kind of performance or recovery we are talking about. Is it- a... Athletic, so uh, this person's an athlete. I, you know, to be honest with you, I cannot think of any offhand. You know, there might be, but I, you know, I cannot uh, recite it. You know, maybe Michael can comment on it. Recovery. Uh, John, do you, do you have any um, experience? Yes. In yeah, we have, we've done a number of uh, clinical studies uh, on uh, performance, recovery. Uh, <clears throat> one was done on the uh, Cobras of Austria under a great deal of stress after 9-11, they were hosting a security conference and uh what we and they're they train significantly these guys were athletes and we have you know uh so what we saw was uh faster recovery uh reduction of oxidative stress basically when you exercise you're stressing a muscle you're doing damage to the body stronger so but there is a phenomenon if you if an athlete goes beyond 80% of VO max, there could be permanent uh, oxidative stress damage, which is I'm talking about protein carbonyl damage. Less than 80% VO max, the recovery is normal. And we saw uh, very good results uh, with plant powders with these athletes and those that were stressing beyond 80% of VO max we actually saw a complete blockage of protein carbonyl damage, which at that level can sometimes be permanent. So yes, there, there's a number of studies on plant powders that show uh, the training effect. You know, many of these athletes, it's two step forward, it's one step back. They push themselves too hard. They stress their immune system, they get sick and they have to back off training for a while. So what we saw from the plant powders was the ability to continue training at a good level without the sickness, without the fallback and steady recovery. So uh, it's very promising. Thank you, John. And you know, uh, as a team physician working with a lot of athletes, including uh, athletes that travel overseas, um, I recommend actually, or have recommended that they take some plant powders with them because the diet can be so inconsistent uh, when you're training. Uh, I know this when I was training for the Olympics, we would end up in like, you know, uh, East, old East Germany, Altenburg, Germany. And, you know, the availability of really good food plants was limited. Yes. And so, um, you know, there, there may be a, a place, especially for athletes in optimizing diet, or at least having improved exposures to diets through things that have been dehydrated or powdered that, uh, can, that can be beneficial. Michael? Um, what's the research show on, on some of these interventions for athletes? I'm thinking of like the, you know, dark cherry juice and some other things that, you know, may be beneficial. Um, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, athletes that don't have a, the, the best diet or even athletes that are eating well and want to look for something to improve their ability to recover from, um, you know, the high uh, oxidative stress of, uh, of performance. 
In terms of performance enhancement, uh, nothing uh, has come close to uh, nitrate uh, containing foods actually improves your ability to extract energy from oxygen. Nothing is as I mean, that's basically uh, a challenging a dogma that we never thought uh, would ever be broken. Um, where are nitrates <laughs> found? They're found in beets, beetroot, beet juice, and most concentrated in dark green leafy vegetables, the number one being arugula or rocket lettuce. Um, I, uh, the timing is very important. And so I have videos about when you eat your can of beets before your 5K to maximize, you know, how many minutes you can shave off. Um, uh, and uh, in terms of, uh, and you said, wait a second, who's going to lug around some, you know, cans of beets and, and, uh, and arugula? Well, actually, fennel seeds um, are kind of a, a, a portable means of uh, nitrate boosting. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I got videos about that too. In terms of the delayed onset muscle soreness, that kind of, uh, you know, uh, after really hard workout the next day, your muscles are sore, so you may not be able to um, train as hard. That's where kind of the tart cherries have come in. Rather than getting tart cherry juice concentrate, I'd rather people actually eat tart cherries. Say, where you get tart cherries? You can get them in canned. You can get canned tart cherries, two ingredients, tart cherries and water. Um, and you can just put your put those cherries on your oatmeal in the morning, and um, uh, and so berries in general for decreasing. Uh, and, and of course, that the only way that's going to improve your performance is it just allows you to recover faster. But if you don't actually train harder, then you're not going to get better performance. So it just allows you um, the uh, the luxury of being able to to train harder. Also, uh, blueberries uh, um, prevent the drop in natural killer cell function. That comes with overexertion. Um, that's why a, a remarkable percentage of people that run marathons, uh, you know, come down with upper respiratory tract infection in the next two weeks, um, is because their uh, their immune system is taking a hit. You can prevent that drop immune function um, uh, eating blueberries and also um, uh, nutritional brewers or bakers yeast also has been uh, shown to uh, prevent that uh, kind of drop in immune function you get from overexertion. And again, that just allows you to work hard, to, to train harder if you're not uh, sick in bed all day. Right, thank you, Michael. And yeah, I, you know, often in ath athletics, what people forget is that uh, recovery is far more important than you realize. You know, performance is really about how quickly you can recover and how quickly your body can regenerate itself before the next exercise bout. So that's exactly right. Thank you, Michael. Um, this was a, a question from an athlete. Uh, is there anyone on the panel uh, who is on a plant-based diet? Were you always on that diet? If so, do you feel better from choosing such a diet versus a non-plant-based diet? Um, I'll answer and say, as an athlete, I started this 20 years ago, and every single year in the last 20 years, I have gotten better. I'm, I feel better today at 54 than I did when I was 30. Um, more energy, stronger, um, much clearer mind, never get sick. And so absolutely. And uh, I wish I knew about this um, sooner, but uh, now that you're here, you're learning about this. So it is, um, it is one of the best things that you can do, not only for yourself, but for your family, uh, for compassion, for animals, for the environment, it is, it is the way to go. So uh, next question. Um, Scott, Scott, I could also comment on that. Yeah, John, uh, please. Uh, I my last national championship was 20 years ago. I was 55 and uh, really I struggled up until my forties with uh, injuries, difficult recovery, the effects of overtraining and uh, plant powders had a huge effect, including uh, a plant-based protein shake uh, once or twice a week during competition. So, uh, which was mostly vegetable powders, uh, vegetable protein. Uh, and so, yeah, for me personally, uh, most of my success was after I started to change my diet. Uh, even though I played college football, college baseball, got drafted in the major leagues a couple of times, uh, it was always, there were always some training and health issues. Those pretty much went away with, uh, a change of my diet. That's right. I really believe there's a competitive advantage for athletes on a plant-based diet um, above and beyond um, almost anything else. So uh, here's a good question uh, for um, Barat maybe. 
what are your thoughts about herbs and spices affecting the microbiome? Um, what kind of effect do they have on the microbiome? Is it positive or negative? Oh, <clears throat> whatever I know, it is all positive. I have yet not uh, read any report that uh, a, a lot of the spices affect the microbiome in a, any negative sort of way. So uh, I cannot tell you anything in very concretely offhand, but I'm sure that it is everything is very positive. Michael, do you know of any studies on um, alterations in populations of microbiota with uh, herbs and spices? You know, I mean, we cannot simultaneously uh, wax on about the antimicrobial effects of so many of these plans and not be concerned about concern uh, about, you know, what effects it might have on the other end. So, for example, green tea. Um, uh, I mean, the reason that they gave, uh, you know, one of the reasons they gave tea to World War I soldiers was to prevent dysentery in their water bottles. Um, uh, green tea is antifungal, can be used for, for, for foot fungus and dandruff and uh, is antiviral, is antibacterial. But wait a second, if it's so amazing at wiping out bacteria, what happens when you drink it? Um, that was a legitimate concern, um, and we didn't know until it was put to the test, and green tea actually improves the microbiome. It actually um, has a bifidogenic effect, which is uh, uh, basically used as an as a index of good bacteria in general, even though it's just targeting um, uh, bifidobacterium. Um, but it actually has positive effects on microbiome. Um, and so, so you really can have the best of both worlds. Um, it's not one or the other. Yeah, that's great. And can, real I, quick, can I uh, comment Michael, something? Yeah, real quick. I just want to have Michael just uh, clarify, hit this with a bullet point. Um, top tea, if you were going to drink a tea, what would you choose? So actual tea, meaning green, black, or white tea. And, uh, and if you want a caffeine-free option, hibiscus tea. Okay, excellent. And is matcha better than a green tea? Matcha is better than a green tea because you're actually eating the tea. Otherwise, tea, otherwise, is like you boiled some collard greens, threw out the collard greens, and drank the water. Why would you do that? Throw away all that nutrition. Might as well eat the whole green itself. And that's what <laughs> you get with matcha tea. Or spoon out your hibiscus tea, right? <laughs> but you can actually eat hibiscus sepals. I mean, you yeah, can actually buy dried hibiscus. You go to like a Mexican market and they have big bags of them. They're unsweetened. They're tangy. They're chewy. They're delicious. Taste like fruit roll-ups. And you're just eating hibiscus all day. Yeah, I've done it, Michael. Scott, can I comment? Right, please, yeah. You know, it's interesting. When you said microbiome, I did not quite get the implication in terms of the bacteria and viruses and fungi and so forth. Uh, one of the first paper ever to be published on turmeric, that turmeric is antibacterial agent. First paper. And it came out in nature. And as of today, turmeric is uh, anti-termite. If you have a termite problem around the house, <laughs> you sprinkle turmeric. And it's a standard you know, thing to do. It is anti-termite, antiviral, even HIV, completely wiped out by turmeric. Okay, And there are plenty of papers published on it. So it is anti-HIV, anti-termite, antiviral. And there are a number of viruses that have been shown to be killed by turmeric. And it is antibacterial. Again, the list is very long. And it is antifungal. There are a lot of papers published on turmeric being antifungal. Okay. So, so I can go on and on and on. But the fact of the matter is, it not only kills the cancer guy, but it kills out all those microbiome that are, you know, things that are out there. And there's no problem at all. There are tons of literature. Sorry. Great, thank you. Paul. I just want you to I just want you to clarify, Dr. Agarwal, when you're talking about wiping out HIV, you're talking about in vitro, um, right? I mean, I just want to make sure that we don't have people with uh, HIV AIDS skipping their protease inhibitors to take turmeric. Not that turmeric wouldn't be great, but the uh, it's in vitro evidence for turmeric and HIV, correct? Yeah. So so to begin with, it is in vitro, 
and uh, and there uh, might be some studies in vivo i cannot tell you offhand but in vitro definitely it has been shown in the laboratory that it works right and so michael your point is important that uh, you know as we add in you know herbs and spices and we read about the benefits um, you know differentiating the types of trials and then uh, encouraging people anybody watching to not make any changes to your health care even though you transition to a whole food plant-based diet or add in some of these herbs and spices, you know, to work with your doctor, don't make any changes to your medications, do the best you can to optimize your health, and as you get healthier, your doctor will help you work through some, any medication changes that uh, are specific to your condition. So thanks for pointing that out, Michael. And oh, uh, by the way, coronavirus too, it binds to the coronavirus, it binds to the receptor of the coronavirus, and it blocks the end result. All those three different stages have been shown with curcumin. In vitro. In vitro, of course, yeah. you know. So so <laughs> there are not that many clinical trials. No, no, you are, you are absolutely right. But at least uh, based upon whatever is out there available, yes. So I cannot, uh, you know, there might be clinical trials, but I, I'm not aware of. Uh, John, we had a person, uh, one of our uh, participants wanted you to clarify and say, uh, how can you explain that plant powder is a catalyst for making healthier choices? Uh, it's just based on the, uh, the results we got from surveying a million families. And how do you explain it? Uh, first of all, the, I think the body, you, you eat a lot of sugar, the body's going to crave sugar. You start eating plant powders, the body's going to crave plants uh, in very simple terms. But also when the family's doing this together, you know, there's an awareness of the value of uh, eating plants, uh, eating fruits, vegetables, berries, and grapes. And so this is what we observed was that the, the families started eating a better diet, less fast food. Uh, less packaged and processed food. Uh, so I think it's, it's a combination of what's going on internally, what the body's starting to look for. I mean, and secondly, the awareness of a healthier diet, the family doing this together, and they uh, naturally transition to the foods themselves. And by the way, our company uh, also has a hydroponic aeroponic growing system, which is a very convenient way for the families to grow veggies. Uh, and and a, it was developed at Etcot. Uh, we acquired it from them. And so we're, we're very committed to, you know, families growing, eating uh, whole foods on a daily basis. So uh, I think we're all on the same page here. We're just we're just dealing with the realities of convenience, wide variety, uh, and awareness. Michael, here's a good question. Uh, somebody asked, and it's important. Um, any concerns for the effect of herbs and spices uh, for people with thyroid problems? Um, there are goitrogenic compounds in uh, some healthy foods, uh, soy, broccoli uh, and flax seeds. So if you think of ground flax seeds as a plant powder or uh, I, I don't know, some kind of powdered cruciferous product, um, we would be concerned about people, uh, about impairing the thyroid function of people with marginal iodine intake. Um, uh, what uh, these uh, compounds do is they interfere with the uptake of iodine into the thyroid gland. So if you're already not getting enough iodine, you can prevent your thyroid from making enough thyroid hormone. However, the answer is not to avoid these super healthy foods. The answer is to just get enough iodine. The healthiest source of iodine are sea vegetables. Like you can snack on nori sheets. Um, a two a day gets all the iodine you need. That's probably the healthiest source of iodine in the human diet. And no. with that, I'm sorry, I have to say that I live in such a small house. And my, it's past my family's bedtime and I'm keeping them up with my my loud voice so i'm going to have to 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 to, to leave everybody i'm sorry i have to uh, run off soon but thank you so much for having this fantastic panel hey michael before you before go, michael can I, leaves can i comment something before yeah, michael we're going to close out actually in in about five minutes so go ahead Bharat, and then michael i, I just checked it there's salmon clinical trial with curcumin and covid salmon 
not just one or two salmon clinical trials oh, and seven, i can send you that one salmon seven send them to salmon. me salmon i can send you all those salmon i'm looking at it database as we speak i'll do a video about it yeah so salmon clinical trials i'll send you all right okay so before you go michael we're going to wrap it up here in a couple of minutes i just want to thank you for your time and absolutely uh, thank you for all of the time you spend doing the deep dive on research and <laughs> We, um, I and so many people learn from you on a daily basis. So we just appreciate you very much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. I'm honored and we'll see you and hopefully everyone in September at the International Plant-Based Nutrition Healthcare Conference in California. That's right. And no conflict of interest or relevant financial conflicts to, uh, <laughs> with that advertisement. So thank you. I appreciate that, Michael, very much. Uh, so just a couple of last, uh, one, one or two more questions. Let's see. Um, last question, maybe for everyone here, and then I'll, I'll close this out. So the underlying premise for the webinar is how to optimize diet using herbs and spices. And um, uh, the question is, if you had to distill your advice for the layperson into three bullet points, what would they be? John, you want to start? Sure. Uh you know, obviously I'm a fan of, of plant powders because of the convenience and the wide variety of, of fruits, vegetables, berries, and grapes that are contained. Uh, I think it's a good place to start for consistency, for simplicity, uh, but clearly uh, plant-based diet is the ultimate goal. And Although I did have a scientist in Europe tell me once he could only eat three foods for the rest of his life. He would eat broccoli, blueberries, and anchovies. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, I think, I think it's uh, you know, a, a simple step in the right direction is what I'm talking about. And that it's, these changes are hard for a lot of people. And so any way that someone can incorporate these foods into their diet on a daily basis is a good place to start. Great, thank you, John. Barat? My bottom line is add spice to your life. <laughs> you simply cannot go wrong. I like it. That's right. We have a large family, we have six children, and so we are always looking for places and ways to add in spices, herbs, uh, nutrient density, smoothies, soups, stews. My wife is a master of blending all kinds of things that our children might never eat. And we throw it in there and they eat it and never know that they've, they've touched it. So um, that's a, a great way to, uh, to slip them in for your children. And as they get exposed to more of those foods, more herbs and spices, their taste buds begin to change and they will acquire new tastes yeah. for foods that they might not have eaten otherwise. We do this with mushrooms, other things that may not be appealing on a plate but blend it into even a chili, they don't know it's there and uh, they get those additive um, uh, opportunities. One thing that we do too at home is we grow herbs and spices. And so we've, uh, we've enjoyed doing that as a family too. And you know, growing something, as you mentioned, the, the tower gardens, growing something as a family is really powerful um, in a great way. So uh, I love your idea of the smoothies, Scott, and it is a great way to incorporate lots of different uh, herbs and spices and uh, veggies and fruits that are masked by the flavor. But so a good protein, you know, plant-based protein shake is a, a, a foundation for your smoothie is a great way to go. Yeah, we make all kinds of great smoothies at home. So um, any last words from either of you? Uh, John, Barad, I wanna thank both of you for being here for your time. Uh, for your expertise and uh, for sharing with us um, your life experiences. Thank you. Thank you. Our Thank you for giving the opportunity. Appreciate yeah, it. It's been a delight. Thank you so much. And for My all pleasure. of those, yeah. all of you that are here, thank you. Thank you for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, obviously, this is a massive area of uh, a massive topic. We could do probably a week on just spices and herbs and you know, uh, and functional foods. We didn't get into the entire category of functional foods. We may do another town hall on functional foods, including, you know, like in Japan, the thousand plus functional foods that are listed in Japan uh, currently. So we're just dipping our toe in the water 
on these topics with town halls and may go deeper in the future. But our desire at Plantrition Project is to create learning opportunities for you to connect you with experts from around the world, uh, to learn, to gather more information so that you can make the best decisions for yourself and your family. We really believe in empowering you as an individual, whether you're a healthcare provider uh, or not, we, we believe in empowering you with information that helps you make the best choice for you and your family because we uh, value, our core value is that you would have the greatest opportunity to maximize your health, to live the greatest life that you um, desire and envision for yourself. Um, the Plantrition Project is um, a not-for-profit designed to really educate healthcare providers. And this year we're launching a new initiative called Plantrition U. This is a legacy project for, here, uh, for us here at the Plantrition Project because we really believe that uh, the earlier that we can intervene in the educational process, the greater the impact we can have through healthcare. Uh, a stunning statistic is that each healthcare provider will reach between 10 and 20,000 people during their career. And so by reaching one single healthcare provider and empowering them, equipping them, and inspiring them with the information that they need to reach their patients can result in a one to 20,000 reach. So our goal with Plantrition U is to package everything that we've ever done, every conference, every lecture, everything that's been written, our journal, these town halls, and more information that we'll be creating specifically for the Plantrition U. We're packaging that on a learning management system. And we're gonna provide that for free to every single healthcare professional student in the world. Whether you're a speech therapist, a physical therapist, dental student, chiropractor, physician, uh, nurse, um, any healthcare profession will have access to the free platform. We want to intervene early. There was a chilling study that I read that uh, upon entry to medical school, about 80% of students believe that nutrition is important. By the end of year two, the number was zero. We are training out of our healthcare professionals the concept that nutrition is important for the prevention, suspension, and reversal of disease. And we want to change that with Plantrition U. And so we're launching our platform this fall. We would like to um, uh, get the word out, but we also need your assistance with uh, you know, raising funds to make this free for individuals. Um, it costs us about $20 to $30 per um, individual to make this available. And uh, our desire is to reach 100,000 healthcare professional students in the next three to five years, which will give us a reach of one to two billion people through this project. So I want to encourage you to please join us. Uh, you can find uh, the donation button at the bottom of plantritionproject.org. We'll put the link in here at the bottom. Or you can just go to the website, plantritionproject.org and join us um, in reaching 100,000 healthcare professional students around the world uh, with this platform. We're very excited. We believe that this will have a far-reaching effect for decades to come, and we would love for you to partner with us as we work with these healthcare professional students and empower them with the exciting information uh, about food as medicine. I just want to thank you all for spending your evening with us tonight. We'll have another um, uh, we'll be doing our next town hall actually from our conference, uh, and so uh, we hope that you'll join us, and then we have a, a final town hall in December of this year. Uh, if you'd like more information on the Plantrition Project, you can locate us at plantritionproject.org. We have a free journal, the International Journal of Disease Reversal and Prevention, uh, with 20,000 subscribers. Look, it's free uh, and open access, um, publishing the science of disease reversal. So on behalf of our entire team, uh, my partners, Tom and Susan, our amazing staff, Alexis, uh, Andrea, and, um, and Beth, and our amazing board at the Plantrition Project, we want to thank you for your time this evening and wish you and your families the greatest uh, wellness and a wonderful weekend. Thanks. Have a great night, thank everyone. You. Thank, thank you, Barat. Thank you, John. Thank thanks, you. Tom. And thanks to Michael Greger.